That is awesome. I would like to present Cliff. He is a healthcare attorney and he came to do a presentation for us today on Mtala. Thank you, Cliff. Go ahead. Thank you, Nancy. Can everyone hear me? Is that overhead mic on? Okay. Well, thank you all. I'll reiterate, thank you all for coming, taking the time out of your day to listen to someone talk and babble on about Mtala. Um, some of the times people, when they hear the word Mtala, they go, I know everything about it, so I just kind of don't pay a lot of attention. But let me give you a little bit of my background. Uh, she mentioned that I was an attorney, so I don't know whether that's one strike against me or not, but I'm a healthcare attorney. But there was a darker side of me when I first started my healthcare career. I was a CMS and state hospital surveyor. So when I walked out the back door of the hospital, I made sure I had armor on the back. But I spent those years surveying hospitals and then probably the last four years, uh, Director of Medical Care for the state of Indiana. So that was my regulatory background and I've been in healthcare practice for 33 years. Doing especially this, this is an area where I feel like it's very important. Why is it important? Because when you leave here, I want to empower you in a sense to have the knowledge to not do some of the things that I'm going to tell you happen because you can't make some of this stuff up. But our whole goal and objective is do no harm to the patient. So we want to set up compliance with the regulation, but we also want to avoid having the government come in and investigate you and issue some of the fines that I'm going to talk about. So that's the stage that I set I want to know how many physicians do we have here? If, show of hands. Nurses? Any security? <laughs> Registration? Good, we'll cover the gamut then. All right, um, so let me start out with a case of uh, importance because a lot of people think that MTALA, which is the Emergency Medical Treatment and Active Labor Act, is a federal law that was developed by attorneys. Not by physicians, but by attorneys. And so if it were written by physicians, we'd probably have a different slant on things. Most people think that MTALA was implemented because OB patients were presenting to the county hospitals and they were being diverted to other hospitals. And Taylor really originated because of gunshot wounds and people not taking care of those particular patients. And let's talk about one of the primary cases that Congress stepped in, President stepped in, and uh, further implemented the MTALA regulations. And it, and it goes something like this. There was a young individual who was in a gang fight in Chicago, Illinois. He was stabbed severely and had some gunshot wounds. He was 200 yards from the hospital. Nobody from the hospital or the staff would go out to get that individual. Police came, brought that person to the front door of the emergency department. So you can envision someone laying in front of your emergency department. Not one hospital person came out to rescue that patient. It's a Ravenswood Hospital case. Congress said, we're going to put a stop to this. We're going to set some boundaries to prevent things like this from happening. So they implemented this statute to try to prevent anyone from being, not being seen, not being cared for, not being stabilized as the way it should be. Let me fast forward. Gary, Indiana. Patient presented with stab wounds, severe stab wounds uh, to the abdomen. He was seen, he was screened by physician, and he was placed on a gurney inside the emergency department. 
There was not one iota of documentation for 36 hours of that patient. None. The patient died. The government stepped in and really pulled the hammer down on the hospital. As a major hospital, they had the capability to be able to treat that patient. We don't want things like that to happen here. Some of the things that I'm going to talk about are not going to apply to this hospital. But if you leave, I want to have you take away that information so that in case you see something that happens, and we'll talk about empowerment of the staff, of the nurses, of the physicians to be able to make sure that things like this do not happen. So with that in mind, I'm going to go through what the basic requirements are. It's, re it's, it's important to know that it's the board of directors, your board of directors that are ultimately responsible for the care and treatment of its patients. And the government holds the governing body to the task of compliance, because if you don't, I'll show you what kind of letter they get. We'll talk about hospital duties, physician duties. Many physicians think that they cannot be fined. I'll tell you why they can be fined. Some of the consequences. We don't want to have these types of situations occur because if you have one EMTALA violation, I don't care whether it's not documenting on the central log or whether it's not documenting properly that a physician is certified risk and benefits, you have one deficiency you will get a letter from the government that says this hospital will be terminated from the Medicare, Medicaid, TRICARE, any federal government programs on a certain date. Board of Directors don't want to get that letter. CEOs don't. You don't want to get that letter because it puts every, a chilling effect on everybody. And I've seen it happen where staff get nervous. Patients, what do you mean the hospital is going to get terminated? That's, that's kind of a scary thing. What's even scarier is if the newspaper gets a hold of it because then there's a lack of confidence that permeates the entire community, the hospital, and the patient. So we want to avoid that at all cost. So within the time frame that we have, I'm going to short circuit because I know that your time is valuable. But EMTALA requires three or four basic things. It requires that any person that presents to the emergency department complaining of a medical problem and requests treatment, which could be implied, they don't have to have somebody speak for them, but you kind of know it when you see it, they're asking for medical treatment. So they present, you have to do a medical screening exam. Triage is not enough. A medical screening exam to determine whether or not the patient's in an emergency medical condition. Now, all of those terms I'm going to try to define as we go along. Once we determine that the patient is in an emergency medical condition, then we have several options. We either stabilize within the capacity and capability of the hospital, or we have to arrange for an appropriate transfer of that patient. An appropriate transfer of that patient is critical. So I just want to ask, and you can, anyone can respond, but what do you think the two most violations of Intala occur? What, what areas are, are prominent in noncompliance with Intala? Somebody. Medical screening exam. No screening exam and improper transfer without accepting physician. Bingo. Improper transfer of patients without an accepting hospital. We'll go through those appropriate uh, requirements. The third one is failure of on-call physicians to respond. So I set the tone of this. Major hospital. Southern Florida. Patient had presented numerous times to the emergency department. And he had neurological issues, 
and he had psychiatric issues, behavioral health issues. He had presented any number of times and seen by the neurosurgeon and seen by the emergency department. Came in the last time, it was actually his last time, and presented to the emergency department, the ED physician called the on-call neurosurgeon, hey, I need you to come in here, I need you to examine the patient. On-call physician's response was, I've seen that patient so many times, I know what the patient's condition is, just go ahead and send him up lifeline via helicopter. Well, what's the ED physician supposed to do? Doesn't have an on-call physician come in, and so he arranges for the helicopter transfer. Some bad things really happened. Patient died on the way to the hospital. So everyone was kind of concerned about what could have prevented this from happening. The hospital got fined over $150,000 for that mistake. <coughs> the bottom line was the neurosurgeon didn't come in, but I haven't told you the rest of the story. Neurosurgeon was less than 100 feet from the emergency department. He was in the hospital, but he decided that he didn't have to come in. We don't want those type of things to happen. We've talked about a person presenting to the emergency department for a medical, any medical condition. Well, I think I heard earlier someone say that this, I'm not a, I'm not a clinical person, it doesn't really apply to me, so MTALA doesn't, you know, it doesn't matter. It matters to everyone in the hospital. And here's the reason why. There's a legal theorem that says what a reasonably prudent person would determine. In other words, the common person. If I am in the cafeteria and I am grabbing my chest and complaining of chest pains, regardless of whether you know I'm an attorney or not, I mean, I hope somebody would help me. <laughs> but would a reasonably prudent person think that I was in an emergency medical condition? More than likely. So elsewhere in the hospital, if a patient comes into the hospital and they're experiencing, and we'll define emergency medical condition, experiencing what you think is an emergency, MTALA applies to that person as well. We need to get him back to <coughs> the emergency department. So I want to ask, how many emergency departments does a general hospital have or that you have? How many emergency departments? One. You sure? OK. How about OB? OB is considered an emergency department by the government. What about psychiatric, behavioral health? That's considered an emergency department because they may ha the patients may have to go to those particular areas to receive the appropriate medical treatment. And we'll talk about that. But the key component here is, and we'll get to qualified medical persons, et cetera, is to keep in mind that at least here, you've got an OB department and you've got an ED. Patients present to the ED, expectant mothers with contractions. We'll go through that process. Hospital property. So here again, your parking lot, your area that's out in front, even the clinic area, I think, is suspect. You need to know what to do in the event that a person collapses out there. And there's all kinds of scenarios that we can talk about. But what the government says, anything within 250 yards of the main campus is subject to MTALA. Well, you take a large metropolitan hospital, parking garages, I mean, it, it, it can expand, and MTAL is still going to be covered there as well. So we got sidewalks, parking lots. It does not apply to private physician offices. Medical office building doesn't apply to private physician offices. Restaurants. Here again, cafeteria in the hospital, you're going to be subject to it. If you have physician offices, you can say, Okay, wait a minute, 
the patient collapses, and you think common knowledge is going to say, in the physician's office, the patient collapses, I'm going to get them to the emergency department. I want to make sure that every physician office has the guidelines and the policies that the hospital has established to make certain that the patient gets the appropriate care, and that is 911 plus. First call the ambulance. The plus is making contact with the emergency department and let them know what's going to happen, that a patient may be arriving so that they can expect that patient to come. But that helps in a number of cases. Number one, it alerts the emergency department. But two, if you have a patient that collapses and you really say, as, as, as some hospitals do, I just call an ambulance and that's, I wash my hands of it. That's not good enough. You need to have that second component because when the newspapers and the television people come at your doorstep, you're wanting to be able to say, we had policies, we had procedures, we followed them, we did the best thing that we could for the patient. It may not have been perfect, but at least you've taken care of the patient. Anybody has any questions? At any time, interrupt me. I'll take them because I think that's important for the individual questions and I can get through everything that we need to within those questions. Okay, so hospitals that do not have emergency departments. Doesn't apply here, but your specialty hospitals like orthopedic hospitals, surgical hospitals, heart hospitals. The physicians felt that if they built that hospital that did not have an emergency department, that EMTALA did not apply. The government said, uh-uh. Just because you don't have an emergency department, you have to have policies and procedures in order to review the patient, stabilize the patient, and get the patient to the appropriate place. If you do not have that, then they're going to go after the physicians and the hospital. If they treat Medicare and Medicaid, they're going to get that same nasty letter. They're going to get terminated from the program. So when you walk away from here and you get into another environment, make sure that those hospitals have the appropriate policies and procedures. Um, we've talked about uh, the requirements for the medical screen and one of the ways that you get out of what I call in, in Tala deep trouble is to determine that the patient is not in an emergency medical condition. Once you do that, Mtala no longer applies. Maybe a malpractice, but EMTALA no longer applies, and we'll go through those indices. Once the patient is admitted as an inpatient, EMTALA no longer applies. So when we have a physician writing the order and directing the patient as an inpatient, once that order is written, then EMTALA no longer applies. But the government says, wait a minute, we have certain requirements, and I think you've had a recent CMS survey where you follow through the Medicare conditions of participation. They apply and they will safeguard the patient. So if the left hand doesn't get you with EMTALA, the right hand with the conditions of participation will. What's an emergency medical condition? Don't you think you know it when you see it? There's three types of situations that I feel they're important. I basically break it down. If you're going to lose your life, you're going to lose a limb, you're going to lose uh, a, a bodily function significant enough that may cause death. In other words, it's a significant definition, a higher standard of what an emergency <coughs> medical condition is. A woman presenting with contractions is automatically, automatically in an emergency medical condition. What do you have to do? There has to be an assessment of the patient, and it could be by one of the OB nurses, it could be by the physicians, but there has to be documentation to take that patient out of EMTALA compliance 
and into just the general requirements for the hospital or it may be determined that the physician says it's Braxton Hicks contractions and so it's false labor but the physician has to sign and certify that it is false labor based upon the examination. Oftentimes an OB nurse will be maybe one of the only people in the OB department at the time. That nurse should be in contact with an OB physician before they discharge the patient. Telephone communication between the nurse and the physician, they make an agreement, she documents or he documents in the medical chart. Physician needs to certify that the next time he comes into the hospital. And that's very important that we are formally as a surveyor, I'm gonna look at that certification because I wanna make sure that that physician, it's kind of like verbal orders. You wanna make sure that everything that was said is documented. And if it wasn't documented properly, or if he sees or she sees something that's different, then they can perhaps call the patient and make further examinations. So that's the definition of an emergency medical condition. Now who can determine what a medical condition is? I'm gonna go here. They have to do a medical screening exam. Who is qualified to do a medical screening exam? Well, the governing body determines what and who are the qualified persons, what called QMPs, that can do the medical screening exam to determine what an emergency medical condition is. You can't just name everybody. There has to be certain designations. So in some hospitals, it's only the physicians that are the qualified medical person. Well, in that case, what if a patient presents, is triaged by the nurse, and the nurse says, what you need are a few stitches, and the patient leaves the hospital. Have they received the medical screening exam? No, they have not. The danger in having only physicians be the qualified medical persons, and I hear the argument, the takeaway is the physician is one that makes the final determination about the patient's condition. Well, that's true. The medical screening exam is to rule out that emergency medical condition. RNs by licensure and by statute are able to make assessments. So we have three easy cases. One is the patient presents chest pains, clutches chest pain. There's no doubt that that's an emergency medical condition. The other one is sutures, maybe even a broken arm. That will not be likely depending upon the circumstances an emergency medical condition. The gray area is when the patient presents with non-obvious symptoms, complaining of dizziness, throwing up, disorientation, where you might have to do additional tests in order to determine whether or not the patient's in an emergency medical condition. So in other words, you make a presumption that they are in an emergency medical condition and you take the appropriate actions to make a proper assessment that the patient is not in an emergency medical condition. It could be that you make a mistake. I make mistakes. Healthcare makes mistakes, healthcare individuals. But Medicare requires that you treat each and every patient that presents to the hospital, to the emergency department, with same or similar conditions it's called desperate treatment. You treat them the same, no matter their race, creed, color, gender. If they present with a respiratory problem, you make that same determination, and it's when you decide to wait a minute, this person doesn't have any insurance, so I'm only gonna do certain tests. It's when you stop doing the proper assessment of that individual, the hospital will get cited for failure to do an appropriate medical screening exam. In the back of the handouts, there are a number of cases that will illustrate the failure of the hospital to do an appropriate screening exam based upon a person's 
ability to pay or their race, etc. You cannot treat people differently. And it doesn't make any difference whether they're Medicare or myself coming into the hospital. It applies to all individuals. Now, in the slide here, it says the hospital must provide appropriate stabilization treatment and appropriate transfer. So we kind of reviewed that patient presents in an emergency medical condition, but you don't have the on-call neurosurgeon. You just don't have a neurosurgeon capability. Your escape valve always, always in the circumstances where you have the inability to treat that patient to make an appropriate transfer. And it's a strict requirement to follow each and every one of those rules. If you do have the capability, then you have to treat that individual. I'm going to talk about a case that an individual presented to the hospital with shortness of breath, complaining of chest pains the ED physician contacted the cardiologist who was on call. Did not request the cardiologist to come into the hospital, which is an important part because the ED physician is the captain of the ship. He or she makes the call. If it is determined by the ED physician that that on-call physician come to the hospital as requested, to, to do what? One, assist in the medical screening exam. Two, maybe stabilization. Three, or assist in the appropriate transfer. But this on-call physician wasn't requested to come into the hospital. Now, the patient was transferred to another hospital for a transvenous pacemaker. So, um, the hospital waited three hours before making a transfer. Patient died at the receiving hospital. Here's what the OIG determined. The OIG determined that the hospital had the capability to treat that patient. They had the cardiologist available to do that. The failure to recognize that and have the on-call physician resulted in the hospital receiving a $90,000 fine. So even in the best of circumstances, you can get caught up in a situation where the government takes a second look in hindsight and will cite you. But the important part is ED physician is captain of the ship. He or she makes that particular call. Triage is not the equivalent of a medical screening exam. Many hospitals have policies that are called triage policies but in a sense are actually medical screening policies. But you can't, if you can't distinguish between the two, triage is not the same as a medical screening exam. So some of the hospitals develop policies to cover both aspects, initially triage, but then it has a continuation of the screening exam. Patient that presents with, well, let's take the example here. Let's say a patient presents with non-obvious abdominal medical problems, but is also a behavioral health patient. How many screening exams do you have to do? Two. Because you're going to do the medical screening exam to determine the medical part but you also have to do a behavioral health screening exam. The behavioral health category falls into kind of a common denominator here of if the patient is a threat to themselves or others, then the patient is in a psychiatric emergency medical condition. So you may be able to first treat the medical condition but because you do not have the capability to treat the behavioral health problem, you may be, as physicians, may be able to 
provide medication to the patient, to stabilize the patient as best as you can until you can find a bed to take care of them in a psychiatric hospital. But there are two examinations that are required. A lot of hospitals miss that second part because they fail to do that. And there are many cases where a psychiatric hospital will, will report a general hospital because they didn't perform the psychiatric medical screening exam. All right. We've gone through two of the elements so far. Let's talk about stabilization. It's important from a documentation standpoint that when a transfer for, because you can't, do not have the capability or capacity to care for that patient, you have to transfer that patient. <coughs> there needs to be clearly delineated by nurse's notes and by physician that the benefits of that transfer, i.e. our cardiology patient that needed to be transferred because there was not a, car a cardiologist on call, that the benefits of the transfer outweigh the risk of staying here. So I don't like to see a checkbox saying patient's condition. I want the benefits written out and I want the risks written out. Well, some people say, I don't want to put death down there. That's one of the risks, isn't it? Because patients die en route. Unfortunately, they die en route. But let's not play smoke and mirrors. Let's be honest with the patient. Let's use our best choice in, in judgment. Again, if there's not a physician that available to assess and a qualified person has determined that the benefits outweigh the risks, the physician has to come in and certify that. Documentation is obviously a key but a lot of times it's really absent. Okay, what's an appropriate transfer? Here's the second most, or maybe tied for first, for violations of MTALA. So here are the elements, and they're absolute. Without exception, you have to do it. So there is a determination that the patient is stable for transfer. Does MTALA apply? If you determine that the patient is stable and not in an emergency medical condition, MTALA does not apply. If you reasonably believe that the patient, you're not sure whether the patient is stable or not, then you better treat it as an, an emergency medical condition. So you have to have an accepting hospital you have to have an accepting physician. I want to see documentation of nurse to nurse report and physician to physician report. Sometimes that's not always there. 